Hey YouTube, Jack here, and it is time for Jack's Low Carb Journey episode 39. I believe it's 39. If I'm wrong, I'll fix it when I put it in the uh, in the YouTube description. So, um, a lot of times when I do these episodes, I have taken a question from the audience or something, and I've got like 10 bullet points to cover or something like that. I, I never like write out a script or anything. I haven't done that. I've been doing podcasting for 11 years, uh, public speaking for 30 and I've never had a script in my life. Uh, but I usually do have like, you know, five bullet points or something like that. I don't today. I just have some thoughts for you. And what we're going to talk about today is that fat is what makes keto sustainable. It's not just what makes it work. It's what makes it sustainable. So I want to start out with the word sustainable today and, and make sure we are talking about the same thing right from the beginning. I think you'd figure it out along the way, but... I do not mean when you have the environmentalists say that they want you know something uh, as far as a practice to be sustainable. Now, actually, eating animals and animal products is incredibly sustainable, and that sounds like a another episode of Jack's Low Carb Journey. Maybe even tomorrow we'll talk about how you make animal systems far more sustainable than anything we have in agriculture today, because I think that's an important topic. What I mean by sustainable for today, though, is your ability to continue to eat a certain way long term. Um, I have heard so many people, um, and they're never people that are actually doing real keto, right? They're always people that are onlookers and naysayers, and they're the same people that tell us we're going to get heart disease, cancer, and die. Uh, and, and one of the common objections to keto, again, by people that have never done real, now people may have tried it, and we'll get into maybe what they did versus what they should have done today, but it's, it, it's, well, you may lose some weight. You might, but it's gonna you're going to gain it all back when you quit doing it. Well, first of all, let's take that little objection. You think, stupid? I mean, really. Like, well, you know, you were eating Twinkies and Ho-Hos and Ding Dongs, and you stopped eating them, and then you lost weight, and it's, that's not really a good diet, because if you start eating them again, you're going to get fat again. No shit, Sherlock. Thank you for pointing out the obvious, okay? Um, but the other thing that they say is it's just not sustainable. No one can live this way. And... I've always said, what planet exactly is it that you get your bullshit from? I mean, seriously. Like, when people say, like, this is not, you just can't eat this way long term. First of all, who the hell are you to tell me how I can eat long term? I mean, what, I'll die if I don't get bread and bananas? I have to have bread and bananas or just the space alien police will come and beam my ass up and implant me with cancer genes and I'll die because I didn't eat bread and bananas. I mean, the, the, the level of stupid is, is extreme. But I started to think that almost all myths have origin in fact. And I, I was thinking, well, what is, why do people believe this? Other than the fact that they've been lied to by the establishment who wants to keep you sick and fat, and therefore you're a perfect gerbil in a wheel to make the money. What is the other reason behind this? Is there more truth to it? Here, here's the truth. There are a lot of people that have had some exposure to low-carbohydrate diets, and they don't know what keto means. Keto to them either is Atkins, or some flavor thereof, or it is we pour bacon grease on everything that we eat. Like, and both of those, if you know anything about keto eating, are just, that's not what keto is. But what got me on this topic was this morning, I was taking my morning walk, and I will usually listen to an audio book, or a podcast, or music while I walk. I try to change it, so it's not the same every day. And I've been listening to a podcast by a guy named Dr. Anthony Gustin, and I think he did like two years of podcasts, and I don't think he's do I don't think he's gonna do them anymore because the last one he did was like September fourteenth, so it's been a month. Uh, but he's the guy that founded Perfect Keto, and I don't agree with everything the guy says, but I don't agree with everything I say. Sooner or later, I will change my mind, and therefore I won't agree with myself, right? Um, but I like what he does, and he he actually you know like he can actually do a podcast. And you don't go, what was what was going on? like you don't fall asleep, right? He's he's a good presenter and he's smart. Well, I listened to one of his very first ones. I was like scrolling through and like, let's go way, way back and see when he started. In episode four, he had a guy on this pretty big name, but I'd never heard of him before. His name is Jason Whitrock. Now, Jason is a longtime athlete, longtime trainer. Uh, he's a guy that's 150 pounds, but you look at a picture of him and you think he's 200. He's one of these ripped guys, sports model, that type of thing. Uh, and he discovered keto long ago. He was one of the first big names in keto, apparently. 
And they were having a, a large discussion about the differences in dietary, uh, you know, dietary macros. And he was talking about how when he first discovered low carb, it worked really good. He put a lot of people on it, and some people it worked for, some people it didn't. But it was actually hard to stay on. And along the way, he finds keto. And he found keto because he ended up working with some kids in a psychiatric hospital. They were on a medication that had made them all gain a bunch of weight. And the medical establishment was putting them on a ketogenic diet. And he thought this was crazy because this is a guy, again, you're talking a guy, you know, you look at his abdomen and you can see every muscle. And he was saying how I had to be ready that one of my sponsors called me for a photo shoot tomorrow. I got to be ready to roll. So he was kind of leery on going on to this fat. And he said the only thing he actually did when he went low carb was focus on not eating carbs. Because he focused on not eating carbs because he was afraid of fat because he believed in calories in, calories out as a 100% energy formula. And he believed in the general advice. He, he, so what, the way he put it was you have these two big hurdles for people. The first is carbohydrates are bad. That takes an incredible mental shift for people to accept because the programming's so deep. But then you want to tell them fat is good. So he went on high protein because that's if you're not going to be high carb and you're not going to be high fat, and you're going to eat, all that's left is protein. There's only three macros. Throw alcohol in there if you want to try, but I do not suggest getting you know 1,500 calories a day from alcohol. So he's left with protein, and he had all these problems. And when he finally accepted and embraced and went to a 70 to 80% of calories from fat, everything got better and everything got easier. It also got into carb cycling and why he no longer recommends that, even though he was the source of it. Uh, and I agree with a lot of that. And anyway, you want to hear that whole episode, you can listen to it. I got a link in the video notes there for you. Uh, but one thing hit me, and I got to go back and listen to the episode because I couldn't listen anymore. Fat makes keto sustainable. They never said those words, but as he, as I listened to his story, a light bulb went off in my head, and it wouldn't go out, and it was so strong that I wanted to talk to y'all about it, and I really couldn't focus on anything they were saying until I got this out. And, and that's the reality. When people say that keto is not sustainable, they're talking about high-protein diets, whether they know it or not. They think it's high-fat because this is the other thing. You understand the mentality of the source of the information, right? So one of the things that I got from a person on the YouTube channel here as I started doing these was, you're going to eat fat stuffed with meat. See, that makes no sense. Okay, first of all, someone needs to work on understanding what a logical argument is, right? You being feigning outrage at something is not a logical argument. But why do you think the mat the the meat is stuffed with fat? Right? If we look at a cut of meat like sirloin or tenderloin, right? Those are both incredibly lean cuts of meat. They have a very low percentage of fat in them. If we look at things like white meat, chicken, etc., it's not stuffed with fat. But in people's heads, meat is bad. We should only eat, remember the meat. It's a little bit of meat, right? The bottom of the pyramid is, is, is grains and then vegetables and fruits, right? And then up here near the top is meat and then fat. So in people's heads, meat equals a lot of fat. So people go on low-carb diets, and they think they're eating high fat. And what it made me realize is I had my struggles in the past with weight gain and weight loss and doing programs like Protein Power from the Dr. Z, which I really liked at the time. And I still do, but I think there's a flaw in it, and that's there's not enough fat. That what, what happened is since I didn't worry about fat, I wasn't afraid of fat, but I didn't think about it. I just kept my carbs right and followed the protein gram requirements in those diets. That what happened was there were times I was eating very ketogenic and times that I wasn't. I was going in and out of ketogenic eating but staying low carb. And it never really occurred to me that like the times I felt the best were the ones where my fat was high. And they were ironically times where I had to adapt to the situation because I wasn't cooking for myself. So you might go to the Olive Garden with friends and... You know, I can't have my sopa discana with potatoes in it, and I can't have pasta, and I can't have breadsticks. So I would, like, have the salad and order, like, the Chianti braised short ribs, which I'm making my version of that right now in the oven. If you guys could smell this place, it would just, you'd salivate, right? So I, I would have that and salad, and if it came with pasta, I'd be like, I don't want the pasta. Well, we can do potatoes. No, I don't want the potatoes. Like, uh, grilled vegetables? Yeah, you got that. Okay, so I want grilled vegetables. We get two sides. I don't want two sides. 
Okay, but you get two... Will you, can I have double vegetables? Well, we have to charge you more. So, I get two sides. But if I want them to be the same, you got to charge me more to put double vegetables on my plate. Yes. Can you do that and shut up and get out of my face? Right? So, in that situation, right, would be where I would, like, I would eat that way in front of people. And they're like, oh, my God, that's your diet? And I'm like, yeah. And, I mean, don't get me wrong. Even though I was really heavy before I started this again, I've lost and gained weight a bunch of times doing this because... High protein, low fat is not sustainable. You can't keep eating that way. You will. I, I'm not going to say you can't, but you won't. That's maybe that's more important. Can't. Well, you can do anything. I, I guarantee you. If somebody said you, if you eat high protein, uh, moderate fat, and low carb for one year, and we monitor your diet and you don't cheat, I will give you a million dollars. One year from now, I'd be like, I'm going back to keto, and here's my million dollars. Right. So I can't, but you won't. You won't. But when I would eat like that, because that's what was available, or I'd get a you know, grilled ribeye or something, I would feel fantastic for a while. And then, you know, as I was going home and eating things like chicken breast and stuff like that, again, I wasn't trying to avoid the fat. That's the important thing to understand. It wasn't like I was trying to avoid fat. Because I might eat one day bacon and eggs. Lots of fat. But the next day for, for breakfast, I might have had some leftover chicken, threw it in, and, and ended up with, you know, something that I was way heavy on protein and way light on the fat. I was also doing things back then to try to get my grams of protein that they told me I needed, which I didn't. Uh, so I would do things like, you know, I had eight eggs, but six eggs whites and two yolks. And again, if you follow Protein Power by Dr. Eats, and he's done some amazing work, I'm going to put him down, um... They're big on, like, you don't have to worry about the fat, but you need the protein. And if you got to eat so much fat to get your protein, it's not acceptable. That's what it actually says in the book, not acceptable. Like getting all your protein from cheese, not acceptable. I agree with that one, but you see what happens there. You end up with this imbalance, and you're eating huge amounts of protein, which if you're weight training and all, for a while that will work, but eventually it will backfire on you. What's made this different this time is by eating about 20% in that range, and sometimes it's a little higher, but about 20% of my calories from protein, 20 carbs or less, and the balance from fat, sustainable. Sustain See, I don't even like the word sustainable when we're talking about ecology, right? Sustainable means barely hanging on. Barely surviving is what's sustainable. Regenerative is what we, and we might talk about that tomorrow with ecology and how we can actually grow animals way more regeneratively than we can ever sustainably grow corn and beans, right? So when you look at a body process, sustainable is living in a gulag, but they feed you 1,800 calories of gruel every day. You won't die. You'll sustain. When you're looking at a bodily process, the things that we're doing to our body, our body to stay alive needs to be regenerative, and when you're eating a a high fat, is we th is it even high fat? Why is it? Why do we even consider it high fat? Majority of calories from fat. That's what we're eating. It, it's not high fat. In many instances, when you look at somebody that's ketogenic, they're eating about the same amount of fat that a person on the standard American diet is. They're eating higher quality fats. That's one difference. But they're eating a lot less calories. They're eating a lot like, because you can eat this massive amount of fat, if you want to call it that, and if you pair it with carbohydrates, you can keep going. You can eat five, 6,000 calories a day easy if you're eating Whoppers or even really good quality, beautiful bun burgers. You can eat massive amounts because we all know the thing. You eat dinner. I'm so full. Do you want anything else? No. What about some dessert? Well, that's carbs. That's what they do. That's how that happens. But when you eat the fat in absence of the carbs, it's satiating. But the other thing it does is it gives your body everything that it needs. And when you're eating adequate protein along with that fat, what's happening is every single day, components of your body, not just when you work out and lift weights and you're doing little muscle tears to build more muscle up, every day, parts of your body are being gotten rid of. You're basically a snake that doesn't know you're a snake. See, a snake every 90 days you know, or so, sheds all of its skin in one big pull, and the new skin's underneath there, you shed little bits of your skin, and I don't remember exactly what it is. It's like six weeks or something. 100% of your skin is gone. 
Your body has to regenerate that. See, sustainable means, ah, it's still here. Regenerative means the new has come. Your uh, autophagy, which is one of the benefits of intermittent fasting and fasting, is your body actually getting rid of bad and replacing and rebuilding itself. What makes keto sustainable is the fact that fat makes keto regenerative. You're regenerating your body, your fingers, your nails, your hair, the cells that keep your eyes bright, your teeth. I'm going to tell you some of the things I've seen happen to me that I, I don't really, I, I guarantee if I wanted to, I could figure out the science behind it, probably without doing any research. If I just sat down and thought about it, because uh, right now answers are coming to me while I'm saying I don't understand it, but I do. Uh, my heels, my entire life, my heels, like if that was the heel of my foot, and here's my toes, would crack all around here. Just crack. This is a big problem diabetics have. And part of it probably is I've been probably pre-diabetic for most of my adult life. Somehow, I've, you know, when you look at my A1C readings, somehow I stay just at the edge. And it's probably the fact that I always tried to moderate carbs even when I was eating too many and eating, even when I was eating garbage. That's probably what kept me right at that edge from, from, from the dimmer switch going to where the light comes on. About, oh, it was only three weeks into this. My wife looks at my feet. I'm sitting on the couch, and she goes, are you working on your heels? I'm like, what? She was like, are you using, because she has a thing that, like you scrub your skin off your heels and shit. And I'm like, not really. She goes, your feet look so much better. That's regeneration. That's not sustainability. Sustainability is the heels are cracked. They don't crack any further so they don't get infected so you don't get your foot cut off. That's sustainable. Make sense? You've sustained. Regenerative is the shit grew back. The bad skin went away. That's regenerative. Look at my face. Right? And I know if y'all are looking at it, we put, we put our video from the other day on our HDTV, and I got to do something about the lighting in here. My nose was like bright white like a snowball, and my face was red. But if you're watching in a computer monitor or a phone or something, it probably isn't doing all that weird shit, and you see what I really look like. Look at my skin in my face. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to be on GQ magazine. I have no interest in that. GQ, I'm just kidding. If you guys want to give me money, I'll take it. No. Anyway, I'm not going to be on GQ mag. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is just, just go look at episode one of this video. Pull it up and look at the skin in my face and look at my eyes. And this is, I will tell you here in a second, um, day 70-something. Weight tracker. Let's see. Day 74. So that video, the first video in this is about day 20. So you really want to see something, go find a video of me that is like a tabletop video like this from like July, right before I started doing this at all. And look at my skin and my face. It's not, oh, this is so great. I'm talking about the comparison. This is regenerative. This is the body regenerating itself. I've got a picture of myself on Facebook. That's my profile picture. It's over 10 years old. It's 10 years old. Somebody said to me recently on Facebook, you look younger than your profile picture. They thought that profile picture was relatively new. And I'm thinking, well, you're not paying attention to this gray here. But yeah, I see what you're, what you're getting at. When, when a guy that's almost 50 years old, and you look at a picture of him when he was almost 40 years old, and you say he looks younger in the picture where he's almost 50, and he hasn't had cosmetic surgery, and I'm not doing some kind of exfoliation. Trust me, I haven't, I'm not going to get plastic surgery. I haven't had anything like that done. And even if it's not hugely dramatic, but you just say he looks younger in this picture except for his gray hairs. That is regenerative. It is the fat that does this. It's the fat that makes it something you can eat this way for the rest of your life if you want to. Like I said, you can transition to more of like a paleo-style diet once you get healthy. And I think people can live very, very healthily that way and very happily that way. And I think those people can be in somewhere in the neighborhood of like 50 carbohydrates. And maybe in a some days more. But you can't go back to eating bread. You can't go back to eating massive amounts of fruit. You damn sure can't go back to drinking fruit juice because that's toxic. You people that give your kids apple juice, stop that. You're, you're, you're destroying your child's liver. You might as well be giving them booze. It does as much damage to the liver without the intoxication so you can keep drinking it. Stop that. But when you start eating the way that we 
see, this is, I, I keep going back to, we, we use the word paleo and keto separately. They're flavors of the same thing. The concept of eating large amounts of meat is our primary source of, of, of diet. For most of humanity, for the majority of the time we've walked the earth, is the way that we lived. We have 100,000 years, 100,000 generations of people eating this way. We're genetically predisposed to eat this way. So a funny thing happens. You start eating the way that you were designed to eat, and your body starts to put itself back to the way you really should be. See, this is what I should look like. Not quite yet, but this is what I should look at like at 47. Not what I looked like two months ago. Two months! Three months! That's the difference in three months. What do you think I'm going to look like in a year? <sighs> if it's this good, I'll be happy. I'll be a year older. <laughs> that's, but just staying where you are, that's sustainable. Regenerative is doing better. And I want to put it to you this way as I wrap up today. Just, just a thought. Imagine that humanity progressed to the point where we could do what they do in Star Trek. We could travel faster than light and wear spandex and travel all over the galaxy meeting strange new alien races. And we came upon an alien race and they said, well, we're so glad you showed up. We're hoping you can help us with your advanced technology. We're like, hey, Prime Directive, dude, we are not giving you any missiles or photon torpedoes or lasers and shit like that. Like, no, we can't do that. We said, no, we're just, we have a health problem. Ah, that's what we do. We're humanitarians. And they said, well, we have this problem. Our entire civilization has started to become overweight. And um, on top of that, we have this disease called diabetes. And you go, well, we're familiar with diabetes. And you go, well, yeah, we have diabetes. We've had it for a long time, but it's like a very small number of people have it. And they're born with it or they genetically get it. That's And they, we go, oh, type 1. And they go, yeah, universal translator works, type 1. Yeah, we got this thing called type 2 diabetes now. And, uh, like, it's, it's, it's to the point where, like, half of our people are going to have it in their life. And it's leading to heart disease and cancer. And we have people just dying younger. So, like, our first generation of people ever are dying younger right now. And they, they explain, and it was just exactly like we live right now. But we had progressed beyond that due to modern medicine and space injections or whatever, and synthahol or replicated food or whatever it is. But we're like, oh, we can't give you all that shit, but we can try to help figure out what happened. And you say, well, what happened? Like, what changed? And they go, we don't know. Like, everybody's actually following the guidelines that we give them of what to eat. We're eating lots of grains and pasta and what have you. And you go, so when did this start? And they go, well, it's, it, it's really the last century, but it's like 50 years ago, it got bad. And like 25 years ago, it got extremely bad. And now it's like going crazy. You're like, well, what? Well, what changed? Well, uh, dietary recommendations. We figured out fat was causing uh, heart attacks, and so we stopped eating fat. Now, imagine you have no opinion on this. You're just examining what happened. And you go, okay, well, yeah. And So what are you eating? So you're eating, like, all these vegetables and fruits we see growing. Well, main thing we eat for, for calories is there's this plant called corn, and we eat the sugar out of the corn. And you go, you eat the sugar out of the corn. How does that work? Well, we use really advanced chemical processes to heat the corn up and extract the sugar. And then you eat it, right? Well, no. We, well, we, we eat half of it. You do what? Well, see, there's, there's, two, there's a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule. Yeah, yeah, we know organic chemistry. We fly freaking starships. All right. So we eat the fructose molecule because it's sweeter. Now, even if you didn't know... Wouldn't you like you a little bit, you know, get a little Columbo? Remember Columbo, the detective from the 70s, right? In the 80s? Wouldn't you be like, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's what y'all are eating. Maybe that's why you have all these problems. What did you eat when, when you were evolving on this planet? And they go, well, like 200 years ago. No, 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 no just stop. Hold on a second. Like, like what, are your, what are your oldest records of a time when, you know, there wasn't a lot of this stuff going on. And they go, well, you know, if, even a few hundred years ago, um, cancers came up, but they were incredibly rare. Um, no one knew of anything like a type 2 diabetes. It wasn't a thing. Some of our civilizations didn't even have a word for cancer. Uh, heart disease was something people got when they were really, really old. Pretty much people died of either uh, diseases that we can cure now, like infectious diseases, or accidents, or war, or being murdered, or old age. That's that's how they died. And you, well, what did you eat then? Oh, we ate primarily animals. 
What would you tell that group of people? I mean, if you separate yourself from this with a thought experiment for a minute and say, okay, so up to this point in human history, the majority of our population ate animals, and if they died, they either got old and eventually quit, because that's, that's, that's our future for everybody, or somebody killed them. Or they got an infectious disease. And by the way, we've got most of that infectious disease shit figured out. Wouldn't you think that longevity should increase? And if a massive change in diet occurred, and right when that occurred, all these problems started going up, how stupid would you have... I mean, how many times would you have wrecked the starship on the way to the planet by flying it into the sun if you were so stupid as not to see that? Welcome to the modern world. Welcome to the modern world. That's the world we live in today. We have more people sick and dying than we have had ever in history from chronic preventable illness. At the same time, a dietary change happened across the whole modern world, and we just can't figure it out. Now, we've got it figured out. Eat animals. That's what you're supposed to eat. That's why you got this big-ass brain that's where it came from, busting bones and sucking out marrow, chasing lions off a kill and eating whatever was left. And I'm going to tell you, as far as the fat, when people say game's lean, you go look at any indigenous culture that eats animals. First thing they eat, the organs. They make sausage on the fly, man. Pull out the intestines, clean them out, and start stuffing them right there with liver and kidney and and lean pieces of meat and the the, 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 the inner cavity body fat, what we call suet. All that shit goes in there and they roast it immediately and they eat it. They take the skin, right, and they make like a big pouch out of it. They throw all the bones after they pull the meat off in there. They take hot rocks and stick it inside there because they don't have a pot. They make bone broth. They eat fat and meat and bone broth. Maybe you should do. Anyway, with that, remember the cause of and solution to all of your problems is probably the person in the mirror, at least most of them. And that mirror is probably in your bathroom where there's a scale on the floor. You start treating your body right, you might get along with that scale better. I will catch up with you tomorrow. Remember, if you like the crazy crap I talk about, subscribe. And remember, I talk about a lot more than keto on my podcast. In fact, I talk about keto only a little bit. Self-sufficiency, self-reliance, independence, and liberty. You will find it all at thesurvivalpodcast.com. Make sure you click the little thing there to get notifications and subscribe to my channel. And uh, you'll hear from me every time something new is going on.